Hello friend, welcome back to Acre Homestead. We are starting out down here doing a little bit of grocery shopping. We are gonna spend the day in the kitchen. We've got dinner we're gonna make. We're gonna make a loaded potato soup. So I need to get some of the homegrown ingredients that I preserved to make that soup. We're gonna make blueberry cream cheese tarts for the landscaper. So I'm getting some blueberry jam here. And then we are also going to be doing a fun project, which I'm really excited to finally get this started. We are going to be starting to make some kombucha again. I used to make kombucha two gallons every two weeks. Josh and I enjoyed that as our dinner beverage. And I have just totally gotten out of the habit of it and I'm excited to get back into the habit of it. So I needed to go downstairs, get some groceries, and also collect some eggs so that we can head up into the kitchen, spend the afternoon in the kitchen, doing a bunch of fun projects and making dinner today. Another successful shopping trip down there. Let me show you what I got from down there. The first thing I got is some frozen shredded cheese for our soup tonight. I'm always gonna have pre-shredded, home shredded cheese in my freezer. I've been using it and absolutely love it. I also got a quart of broth and a quart of homegrown potatoes. We're gonna use these for our soup along with our onions. For our blueberry danishes we're gonna make, we needed some blueberry jam and then I got two cans of just canned blueberries. I also gra grabbed a bag of frozen pumpkin from 2021's garden and I collected two eggs. That's all we got this morning. It's still really early so we're bound to get a few more eggs but that's what I got for today. I don't know what I'm gonna do with the canned pumpkin. I just grabbed that as a reminder. I'm gonna stick it in the fridge and I wanna use it up. So I'm going to probably this weekend find a use for that canned pumpkin. But the first thing we're gonna to do today is get our rough puff pastry made. This is pretty easy. We are going to start by blending the butter into shreds. So I need to go grab from my butter freezer. I keep my butter in a different freezer to make a rough puff pastry. So we're gonna start with that so it can chill in the fridge and then I've got some other fun projects that we're gonna be doing today. So let me grab the butter. This is completely frozen butter. I have one and a half cups of butter, which is three sticks. This pastry recipe makes enough for two. And I'm gonna go ahead, even though I think we only need one, all the pastry recipes I found or all the, da the blueberry danish recipes I found called for using store-bought puff pastry, but this rough puff recipe is really easy, and I don't have store-bought puff pastry, but I have everything else to make this recipe, so we're just gonna go ahead and make it, and it's, it's pretty easy. So I am gonna make the full recipe, which makes two sheets, but I think we only need one of them. And Rough puff pastry freezes, fantastic. So if we don't end up using both of them, I will just freeze it for later and then I will have homemade puff pastry in my freezer for whenever I need it. We wanna keep this butter as cold as possible. So I'm gonna put it in this bowl and I don't really wanna to touch it because even the heat from my hands will warm this butter up. You could use a box grater to do this. The food processor does a better job because you're then not touching the butter and it just goes a whole lot faster. So I'm gonna try to get as much of this butter out of this food processor as I can because I don't want any butter to go to waste. Now I'm gonna take two tablespoons of butter and I'm going to lightly fluff it on top of that butter and then we're gonna mix that in and that's gonna help the butter stay in little pieces instead of wanna clump back together, which it already kinda wants to do. So get in there and fluff it up. The reason this is a rough puff pastry is right here because we first we're gonna make a pastry dough, which we're gonna make right now. And then instead of flattening a big thing of butter into a rectangle and then add it and then laminate it, we're gonna use this and I'll show you how. But we want to keep that butter as cold as possible, so I just stuck it in the fridge until we're going to need it in just a minute. Now we're going to go ahead and make the pastry part of the rough puff. So we need two and a half cups of all-purpose flour, one tablespoon of sugar, 
salt, and we're gonna mix this together. Now we're gonna add half of our butter that we grated, and I'm gonna stick the butter, the rest of this, back in the refrigerator. We're gonna mix this together. We're gonna add one third cup of milk, cold, cold milk. Mix that together. Oop, darn it, I didn't mean to spill that in there. We're gonna add one third cup or so of water. We're gonna mix this together just until it combines. Sometimes when you're making pastry, you need a little bit more moisture. Sometimes you need a little bit less. So we'll start with that. And you wanna use a fork again because you don't want your hands in here warming up the butter, if you can avoid it. So that's still a little bit dry. So I'm going to add a little bit more water. This is the consistency we want, which is perfect. Sometimes there's still some dry bits at the bottom. So we'll see how this is looking when we get this put out on a piece of ceram. Yeah, this bottom part is a little bit dry still. Instead of trying to put moisture in the whole thing and potentially put too much, we're just gonna put a little bit of water in the bottom of this dry part and we will mix that and then we will put this on top. And you can work this just a little bit more than you would pie pastry because we're gonna laminate it so it can handle just a little bit more working, but not too much more if you can avoid it. So now I need to get this into a square. And I usually like to use my saran wrap as a way to help work it into a cohesive ball. I'm kind of folding it on top of itself, so I'm starting the lamination process even while I'm just trying to get it into a ball. Or a rectangle, actually. We don't want it into a ball because we're not making a pie. We want it in a rectangle. So here we have the beginning stages of our puff pastry, our rough puff pastry, I should say. The first time I made this was actually with you all when we did sausage rolls at Christmas, not this last Christmas, but the Christmas before. And that's when I realized it's relatively easy. It just takes a little bit of chilling time. So that needs to chill for 20 to 30 minutes. So while that chills, I am going to show you one of the projects. Well, let's see, what should I do next? Hmm. Let's get dinner going and then we'll do our project that we're gonna do next. It's still morning time, but since I'm in the kitchen this morning, I'm gonna get dinner going so that I don't have to worry about it later. We're gonna get in the kitchen, do our projects, get the kitchen clean, and then we can enjoy the afternoon. So for our potato soup, we need one onion, and this is the only veggie prep we have to do for today, which is fantastic. This is gonna to come together so easy. What inspired this was I found some cooked bacon bits in my refrigerator that needed to be used up. And I thought, let's get a soup on today because it just sounds really easy and delicious. So one kind of medium-ish onion. And these recipes, if you're interested in any of the recipes or projects we're gonna be doing today, I'll link them down in the description box if you're interested. If you can see this right here, this is a hint of the one project we're gonna get going on today. I'm gonna turn the stove on. See. Gotta get used to my oil being right here. We're gonna put just a little bit of oil and mostly we're gonna use butter in this. If I was thinking instead of oil, I should have put bacon grease in there, but oh well.
I don't know if there is any scent that is better than butter and onions cookie on the stove. This, we're going to have to start talking about this now. This is my kombucha continuous brew system, which I absolutely love. And I used to make so much kombucha. Josh and I drank kombucha every single night with dinner. And then life got busy and I got out of the habit. So I have totally ignored this SCOBY and this kombucha and I've never had a problem just leaving my kombucha SCOBYs alone and my dishwasher's going. But I had been buying my kombucha lately because I've been so busy and I haven't been drinking very much of it. So it wasn't worth my time and effort to make kombucha at this, any scale for the little bit I was drinking. But now I'm drinking more of it and it can get expensive if you're drinking it regularly. And so now I want to start making it again. So a couple days ago, I went into my continuous brew system and I found something very, very disappointing, which I've never seen on my kombucha before. And I researched and I figured out why this happened. Can you see down in there, that green right there? That and that, those spots over here, those black little spots, that is mold. I have never had my kombucha mold on me before and I could not figure out why did this happen. I was so disappointed when I went into my walk-in pantry up here and I found the mold on that because that meant that I couldn't use this. I needed to start over. And I did some research and I found out, which I knew kombucha doesn't like to brew at a cold temperature, but it doesn't like to sit at a room cold temperature either. My walk-in pantry where I had it, so let me show you. Right here is the coldest area in my house. This walk-in pantry here does not have any heat in it, which makes it an absolutely perfect place to store food, a cool area, but it's not a good place to store your kombucha. So I was gonna show you how to make a SCOBY for $3, 350 by going to the grocery store and buying a plain bottle of kombucha and making your own SCOBY yourself. That's how I started making my SCOBY. The first time I ever made kombucha and it was the best kombucha I have ever, the best SCOBY I've ever had. But I went to four different stores, New Seasons, Trader Joe's, my local grocery store and natural foods. And I could not find plain kombucha anywhere. I even looked on Amazon and I could not find just a bottle of plain kombucha. So I purchased a SCOBY. So I'm gonna show you how we're gonna start making kombucha again. So, so easy, the easy way. So this right here is eight tea bags and I just put really hot water in here and we're gonna get this tea steeping and we're gonna set this aside. So we have now already started making our kombucha. This scoby needs to be given to the chickens. I've never given a scoby to the chickens before or put in the compost. I'm gonna put it in the compost because it's moldy. And this whole thing needs to be sterilized. At the very least, it needs to be sanitized, if not sterilized. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take that SCOBY out with the other SCOBYs that are in here. Those are, the SCOBYs at the bottom are beautiful looking SCOBYs. They just are contaminated. This is a continuous brew system. I waited to invest in this until I was making kombucha a lot. I love it because it has a pour spout on it but I'm not gonna start my kombucha today in this because I'm gonna take the whole thing apart. I can take this stainless steel spout out. I'm gonna run that through my dishwasher and I'm gonna run the ceramic crock through my dishwasher on the sanitization setting. But I wanna get my kombucha going today because I want to start that process because I like a kombucha that brews for about two weeks. So. We'll get the kombucha starting today and I'll sanitize my continuous brew system in the meantime. For years and years and years, I made kombucha in one of these one gallon glass containers. I like it because it has this lip. You can get these on Amazon or Walmart. I happen to get this at Goodwill and it has a lip. And then I did purchase a new SCOBY and starter here that we're gonna make our kombucha with. If you are able to find plain kombucha, at your local store, all you need to do to make a SCOBY is make up some sweet tea, 
about a cup of sweet tea, pour the whole bottle of kombucha, plain kombucha in that, cover it with a rubber band and something so that dust and debris can't get into it or fruit flies or something, and then let it sit for two to three weeks and a scoby will form. While our tea is steeping, we're gonna go ahead and get the kombucha going. Oh, that is carbonated. I'm gonna put this whole bottle of really carbonated kombucha into our vessel we're gonna brew our kombucha in. So this right here is our starter culture of kombucha. All it is is plain kombucha. This right here is our SCOBY. You wanna make sure you have very, very clean hands when you touch your SCOBY. And what a SCOBY is, is it's a symbiotic relationship between yeast and bacteria. And this is an absolutely beautiful SCOBY. So we're gonna get that in there. I'm gonna go ahead and pour that starter culture in there as well. It smells fantastic. Somehow I completely missed making the sweet tea. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take the tea bags out of our black tea. This is black tea if I didn't mention that earlier. We're gonna compost the tea bags and then for one gallon of kombucha, we are gonna add one cup of sugar and stir that to dissolve. We're gonna let this sweet tea cool down to less than about 85 degrees. And once that's cooled, we can pour the sweet tea into our brewing vessel along with our SCOBY and our starter culture. If the SCOBY kind of weirds you out a little bit, a SCOBY stands for a symbiotic relationship between yeast and bacteria. It's the yeast and bacteria that are eating the sugars that we are gonna be adding to the sweet tea that turn that sugar into acetic acid. And that's how all vinegar is made with a SCOBY. Almost all vinegars in the process of them turning into vinegar, whether that's apple cider vinegar, white distilled vinegar, during that vinegar process, a scoby is formed. It's just not something, because not very many of us make homemade vinegars that often, do we see the scoby. This is a puck of frozen garlic. I'm gonna put that in there. I'm gonna let that cook for just a minute. And I just added some flour. We're going to finish, or do a little bit more on the soup while we wait for our tea to steep. Because we need that to steep for a good 15 minutes or so before we turn it into sweet tea. And now our flour and garlic have cooked just a little bit. So we're gonna get this heated back up and I'm gonna add our broth and our potatoes. These are homegrown, home canned potatoes. And when you can potatoes, they're mostly cooked, but they can, for a soup like this, I want them cooked a little bit more. So I'm gonna get these in here and I'm gonna get this simmering. When I make my kombucha, I always make the tea a concentrate so that I can fill up the rest of it with just water and it cools down a lot faster. I don't wanna make an entire gallon of sweet tea and have to wait for an entire gallon of sweet tea to be cool enough to put into our brew with our SCOBY, if you put anything over 110 degrees on your SCOBY, you're gonna kill your yeast and bacteria, which is exactly what you don't wanna do. So now I'm just gonna fill this up with water and that's gonna dilute our sweet tea concentrate. I always brew one gallon at a time. It's easy to remember, one cup of sugar, one cup of starter, and eight tea bags. So that's what this is here. You always want to make sure when you're using your water though with your kombucha that you're not using non-chlorinated and fluoride free if you can because that can affect your starter culture. This is a live living thing and so if you're adding chlorine to it, there's yeast and bacteria in here. Chlorine is designed to kill yeast and bacteria so you don't want that in your kombucha. I live with a well so I don't have to worry about that but when I lived in the city, I would purchase water to make my kombucha. I would just go to the store and get distilled water. And in my area, I could get a gallon of distilled water for 98 cents, I think. And I can get about, I think it's eight bottles from one of these. And one bottle of kombucha in my store is I think $2.99 or $3.99 now. So this is done, but now I have learned I cannot put this in my pantry because it's too cold and it will encourage mold growth. I am, really surprised. I don't know if I'm surprised is the right word, but I'm glad I know that now because now I can make better decisions about caring for my kombucha starter. 
or my kombucha brew. If you know someone who makes kombucha, ask them for a SCOBY. Every single time you make a new batch, your kombucha will grow a new SCOBY. So if you know people that make kombucha, they have more than enough SCOBYs to go around. So this is done. So now we officially have one project done. I'm gonna let this sit for probably about two weeks and then we will bottle it and flavor it and I'll show you how to do a second ferment. I do have a whole dedicated video on this where it's more step-by-step -step. I can link below and I can also link if you're interested in starting kombucha some really good resources online resources for you and a book that really helped me when I first started really it's very easy so don't be intimidated by it just know you need to store it somewhere warm so I'm gonna store it somewhere in my kitchen I'm just not sure yet where I'm gonna store it maybe we'll put it right here next to the teapot and the coffee grinder now you can see i put a towel over this with a rubber band that's why if i'm not using my continuous brew system i really like these containers because they have this lip so that i can put a towel in a rubber band you're only doing this because you don't want fruit flies or dust or debris getting into your kombucha you don't want to put anything tight on it because you want it to be able to breathe. Again, this is a live, living thing. So we're going to slide that there. And now we have our kombucha going again, which I'm really excited about. Another thing I'm going to do is I'm going to wash the top of my continuous brew system. This is the little cap that it comes with because I want to make sure this is really, really clean when I go to use my continuous brew system again. And there could be mold spores on the inside of it. So I'm just going to run that through the washing machine and now we can get going on our blueberry cream cheese danishes but before we can actually assemble the danishes we need to let's see where did i put it right here we need to make the puff pastry or finish the puff pastry so i have this mat here i like to roll pastry out on that mat so we're going to get this rolled out We've got our really cold butter and our really cold crust. So the cool thing about this mat is that it has a ruler on it. So I'm supposed to roll this out to about six inches by 15 inches. I always use the granite tiles as a guide before, but now I actually have a ruler. It does not have to be exact exact. This is where it gets interesting. We're gonna put half of our remaining butter in the center. And we're gonna fold this up. We're gonna pinch the ends, push that down, and then we're gonna put the remaining butter on that fold. All right, so we're, then we're going to take this and we're gonna fold this up and we're gonna to try to seal in as much of that butter as we can. So we're not gonna waste this butter that fell out. I'll show you how we're gonna use that. Ideally, we would have got that in here in the first sealing of it, but we will put it in in the next fold. So I'm gonna take that butter and I'm just gonna stick that there and we'll fold it in. I'm gonna fold it in thirds again. And now we're gonna wrap this up. And we're gonna get this back in the fridge. We've officially started making our rough puff pastry. So it's that easy. Traditionally, when you make puff pastry, you would have a slab of butter that you would stick in here and it's a lot easier if you use the grated butter because you don't have to get a stick of butter in a slab shape. So while this is chilling again, because we want to make sure we keep that butter super cold, let's go ahead and we will get started on making the filling, the cream cheese filling. So we need some eggs. There are three components to these cheese danishes, and we are gonna start here with the cheese layer. So there's the rough puff pastry that we've already started, and then here we're starting the cheese layer, and then there's gonna be a blueberry layer on the top. So for the cheese layer, we add one eight ounce block of cream cheese, an egg yolk, some white sugar, 
These are not a very sweet dessert. It's a very mild dessert. A lot of the sweetness comes from the blueberries. So we're gonna mix up the cheese and egg and sugar together until it's nice and whipped and we have a nice smooth consistency. And then we're gonna add some lemon juice. It's kind of almost like a cheesecake layer. It's really delicious. So we're gonna scrape the sides of the bowl and then we are going to mix that together. And that's how easy it is to make the cheese layer part of the Danish. This is the first time I've ever made cheese danishes before and it was a lot of fun and you could let your creativity go wild if you have just like kind of the basic understanding of how to make a Danish. Now we're back at our rough puff. Since it chilled in the fridge for a little while, we are going to go ahead and do one more fold and roll, and then we are gonna get it in the refrigerator again. What we're doing is every time we fold it and roll it, we are adding more layers, exponentially adding more layers. You wanna keep it really, really cold so that it puffs up really well in the oven. So here, since I'm waiting for the dough to chill again, I am just taking my meat chopper and I'm chopping up those potatoes. I want some texture in the soup, but I don't want it to be as chunky as these potatoes are. So instead of taking an immersion blender or something to the soup, I'm just taking my chopper and I'm gonna chop it up so that we have a little bit of texture, but not quite as much texture that is in there currently. My new favorite thing, especially after having the baby, is trying to get dinner going earlier in the day so that once Josh gets home, we can just enjoy being a family and I don't have to worry about cooking. So here we are putting one more layer in this pastry. I am rolling it out again and then, oh, maybe I'm not, maybe we're done. It looks like I'm just rolling it out until it's a little bit flatter, putting it back in the fridge to chill and then I'm gonna roll this other half out. Now the reason when you're working with pastry, whether it's pie crust or even scones or biscuits, you want your pastry to be super, super cold because there is water in butter. And when you put your pastry in the oven, it's the reason you cook most pastries at a really high temperature, like 400 degrees or 410 degrees, is because when the pastry goes into the oven, the water that's in the butter steams really quickly and it puffs up, it forces the layers of pastry, like the flour layer, to expand and then you get your layers. So that is how you get layers in pastry. And that's why whenever you're working with pastry dough, recipes always say chill between uses because you wanna make sure that that butter is super cold so that it steams really quickly in the oven and you get the layers. If the butter is too warm, then the butter kind of just melts in the oven and it becomes kind of greasy. So I am rolling out this pastry really thin because we are about to make the cheese danishes. But you can see that it's not hard to make this, but it is a little bit labor intensive in that you keep having to put it in the refrigerator to chill. Now I'm gonna add some more ingredients to our soup. So this is a loaded baked potato soup, so I'm gonna add a little bit of sour cream. This is a really simple recipe, especially with having the home canned potatoes. You could also use, if you didn't wanna go through the effort of peeling fresh potatoes, you could use frozen hash browns in this and just cook the frozen hash browns with the broth until really tender, and then you can kind of have the same concept. So we added our sour cream, some milk, and then some of our shredded cheddar cheese. I am loving having this home shredded cheese in my freezer. I will always keep this in my freezer from now on. I think when I come home with my bulk cheese order, coming home, shredding a bunch of it, freezing it has been one of the most convenient things and I will continue to do that moving forward. I'm, I have this soup on a very, very low temperature and I'm just gonna gently let that cheese melt and the milk warm up. Now I am cutting the pastry into Danish shapes. Now one thing I did learn that I should have done and I didn't know that until after I made this was 
it only really puffs up where the pastry has been cut. So you can see that on the outside edges, I did not take the time to cut that pastry. Well, the pastry doesn't, I don't know what about it, but the pastry doesn't really puff up as well if it hasn't been cut. So moving forward, I will cut every edge of the pastry. Here I'm just scoring, I'm not cutting through, I'm just scoring the inside. And that is just a area where I am gonna be putting the cream cheese filling. And then I will spread that cream cheese filling out on this pastry. And I forgot to poke holes where the inside of the Danish is gonna be. What that does is that helps that area not puff up quite as much. So even though I had already put the cream cheese down, I just went in with a fork and poked the holes and it did not make a difference one way or the other. So I'm just evenly distributing this cream cheese mixture. I end up making enough Danishes and I use all the puff pastry that we made. So I just try to evenly distribute the cream cheese mixture throughout all the danishes that we make. So here is the other sheet. I'm gonna do the same thing. I just cut them into rectangles. It is not perfect. They are not even close to being the same size or same shape, but that doesn't affect the flavor one way or the other. You could use the same cream cheese mixture and you could use strawberry jam instead of blueberry jam. You could use rhubarb, raspberry, whatever you have. I just wanted to use the blueberry and that's what I used today. And the cool thing is this blueberry jam that we're gonna be using today is from blueberries that grew on the last homestead. So those are homegrown blueberries, which is pretty, pretty awesome. This homestead has six blueberry plants and I got about two gallons worth of blueberries last year from these blueberry plants. I hope in the future one day we will be able to plant some more blueberry plants, but that probably won't happen for a while and that's okay. So here's the jam and I, I do have a recipe for blueberry jam. I could link that down below along with the other recipes that we make today if you wanna try making blueberry jam this summer. It's so good. So I just put a good spoonful of blueberry jam on each one of these. I didn't measure or anything. I just eyeballed it what I thought looked like a good amount. And then I'm spreading it on the cream cheese mixture. I was gonna top these with the canned blueberries, but they weren't the prettiest thing. They work really well in baked oatmeal, but I didn't think they were super pretty. I'm trying to do it here on these cheese danishes. If I had fresh blueberries, I would top these with fresh, but I don't have fresh. So I decided not to put the canned blueberries and I just put a little bit more blueberry jam on each one of these. And then I'm gonna pop them in the oven and we're gonna bake them. Now that our danishes are in the oven baking, I am gonna go run outside and we are gonna grab some chives from the garden so we can give our soup a taste test. This soup is for dinner, but I can get in a bowl so I have something to put the chives in. I'm probably gonna have some for lunch anyway, so let's go get some chives. I harvested these yesterday and I didn't leave much out here. So I'm just gonna get what I can get. There's not that much, but it will at least give a little bit of flavor and color to our soup. It was kind of cold this morning. That's why I decided to make soup, but it is probably almost 60 degrees out there. So what I'm done in here, I'm gonna change and spend the afternoon outside because it is so beautiful. I definitely don't need this sweater on and it's kind of funny I made soup, but the soup I think is still gonna taste really good. So let's give it a taste test. This right here is what started the idea of this soup, just some leftover bacon bits that I had in the fridge. You can add your bacon back to the soup, but I don't like to do that. I like to top it on the top. So we're gonna give this a taste test. I'm gonna have a little bit for lunch. The baby is back down for a nap again. So this is perfect timing to kind of take a quiet moment to eat my lunch. It's just him and I here today, so thanks for hanging out with me in the kitchen. So when he's napping, I have some company. So I'm gonna to top that with some bacon. Just a little bit more cheese on the top. I just gave my chives a wash, so I'm gonna slice them up nice and thin here. We're gonna to top that on our soup. And look how yummy that looks. That's gonna be a delicious lunch. Before we can taste that soup, I need to rotate these. 
Oh my goodness, they are puffy, which is great. They definitely aren't done though. All right, now we can taste our soup. All right, friend, let's give this a try. I wanna get a little piece of bacon, cheese, and a little chai in my bite to make a perfect bite. Wow. This is so good. This is a hug in a bowl. So easy. This soup didn't even take me probably 15, 10 minutes to put together. So easy. Having the canned potatoes, so convenient. Having the cooked bacon in my fridge, amazing. Mm. This is so good. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to sit and enjoy this while, that, while our blueberry danishes continue to cook. Mmm. I also poured myself my second cup of coffee. It was kind of a crazy morning this morning and I never got around to finishing or even having my second cup of coffee. It's cold. I should probably <laughs> reheat it, but I'm not worried about that. I'm gonna take a minute by myself recharge, relax, and then dinner's done. I've been loving, I think since becoming a mom, I don't know, but I am loving having dinner done earlier in the day. It's really helped just when Josh gets home from work, I don't feel like I then have to pass on the baby to him so that I can make dinner. If I already have it done, this doesn't happen all the time, just sometimes. And when it does happen, I really enjoy having our dinner done so when Josh gets home we can kind of just hang out together and be together and enjoy each other's company and then sit down and have a really good meal and then I generally try to have the kitchen clean too not always the dishes done sometimes I wake up in the morning my first cup of coffee is while I do the dishes but it's kind of my new thing that I have found to work really well if you guys have any crock pot recipes I was thinking about turning this into a crock pot recipe but I wasn't sure how that was going to go and I want to start using my crock pot more. So if you have your favorite go-to crock pot recipes, would you be willing to share them with me? Because I want to start using my crock pot. I just find that sometimes the crock pot, things get really watery, if that makes sense, because there's all the steam in there. And so I, if you have your favorite crock pot recipes that turn out wonderful every time, I greatly appreciate that. All right, I'm gonna finish my soup. After I got my soup done or finished eating and enjoying, I went ahead and I thought I might as well tackle the kitchen. Like I said, if I can try to get the kitchen clean before the end of the day, I really, I think myself later doesn't always happen, but I appreciate it when I'm able to get to it. I'm just waiting for the danishes to be done. So instead of not cleaning the kitchen while I'm waiting, I figured I might as well get the kitchen clean. So that's what I'm doing here. These would be so beautiful if I had fresh blueberries. I decided not to put the canned blueberries on just because the texture of them is a little bit funny. They are perfect if you bake them in baked oatmeal, but because they were gonna sit on top, I just decided to skip them. Look, I've got two little ones. I'm gonna check the bottom to see if it's cooked. Oh yeah, it's nice and brown. Do you see that? It's hot, really, really hot, perfect. I put those ones in for just a second longer. These ones are done. Let's see if I can show you the layers. You see the layers on that? How beautiful. I'm gonna give the one tray that's in the oven still, you know, let's see. I'm gonna give this a few more minutes too. I don't want that pastry to be undercooked. This one I think is done. We'll take that one off. The last thing I would want to do is go through all that effort and then have the pastry be underdone. I'm going to give this one a taste test while they're in there. The cream cheese that was exposed to the oven heat is, oh yeah, 
that pastry. A little piece just fell off this one and the dough is not quite done. So I'm glad I put them all back in the oven. Done enough for me at least to give it a try. Oh my gosh. Can you see that? That's where the cream cheese filling part browned a little bit. It wasn't covered in jam. Yeah, it only needs two more minutes in there and then it'll be perfect. I am not complaining. This is so good. You know what's funny? I've never eaten a cheese danish before because they always sounded kind of gross and the store-bought ones never looked very good to me. That is so good. It's sweet, but not too sweet. The fact that you only put a little bit of sugar in that cream cheese filling lets the jam be the sweet part. Oh my gosh. That would be perfect for brunch, baby shower, um, dessert anything so good now what i want to do is i want to try making a ham and cheese danish i think with a gruyere cheese and that puff pastry recipe so good i hope you give that puff pastry recipe a try it's not hard it is a little labor intensive in the fact that you do need to keep chilling it and making sure the butter stays really really cold that's the key okay, i'm still gonna give them a minute longer Kitchen's clean, except I need to unload and load the dishwasher, but the dishwasher has another hour on it. And then I am going to let these danishes cool. Once they're cool enough, I'm gonna bring them out to the guys to enjoy. I'm kind of bummed if I had had these, <laughs> my morning went a little bit smoother than it did because there was quite a few hiccups in the midst of this day. Then I would have been able to go run and bring them out to them while they had their lunch. They just finished up their lunch 10 minutes ago, but that's okay, they will go home. I'll give it to them right before they go so they can enjoy this on the way home. Josh is gonna be excited about giving this a try and soup is done. So I am just so grateful you took time out of your day to spend time with me. If you're interested in any of these recipes, I will link them down below. I wanna say thank you for being here, thank you for being you, and I can't wait to see you next time. Bye friend.